Okay, well we normally think of uh, black holes as forming when stars collapse under the influence of their own gravity. They, the pressure that tries to keep them up isn't enough to stop them from collapsing in and then they inexorably fall down into a singularity and form an event horizon. And they have a mass of order, at least a mass of the Sun, a solar mass. There could be a few more tens of solar masses and uh, even, even the ones in the centre of our galaxy. The supermassive black holes have millions of solar masses, but these are different. These particular ones could have masses down as small as 10 to the minus 5 grams. 10 to the minus 5 grams is it's, it's the Planck mass, but it's a, a, probably the, the mass of a neuron or so. They, were, they could have formed extremely early on in the universe, in the period which, which we would associate with quantum gravity scales. Uh, but they can, they can, we can have a range of masses. We could have a mass uh, that size of a golf ball. We could have a mass, a particular interesting one, that uh, mass range is around 10 to the 15 grams. That's about the size of the mass of Mount Everest. What is a primordial black hole? Okay, well it's a black hole, but uh, it formed very early in the universe. That's kind of where the primordial bit comes from. You don't have to have a star to form a black hole. I think that's the key thing here. What you need is a region of high density of, of matter, of material, and then you need some big fluctuation which occurs over a region of, the sp of space in which you get an increased amount of matter such that it, you've got so much matter that it falls within what we would call its Schwarzschild radius and an event horizon can form and you formed a black hole. It ha didn't need to come from a collapsing star, it can just be that there was some fluctuation which arose from something happening in the early universe which led to this uh, formation. What's the conditions here? There's no stars or anything is there? Have we got like a no, soup these, of particles? Yeah, or? these could have formed way before stars form. They, they could form, they, some of the best probes we have of the very early universe, the fact that these these massive objects are forming so early on. And yes, it's, it's because there's a primordial soup of particles there that could have coalesced for, for some reason, some fluctuation occurred, driven by, any, by lots of different f types of phenomena. One of them is in the inf during a period of inflation, the u u when the universe expands exponentially fast, that you have fluctuations of the, of the energy density responsible for inflation, and those fluctuations can, in regions of the universe, cause these things to form. I, I suppose in the very early universe, you're thinking of the quarks and the gluons that are around. It's, you know, sub, sub a second, time, before a second when you might say the first nuclei form at the time of nuclear synthesis, certainly way before 300,000 years after the Big Bang when you think of the first atoms forming. So these are the building blocks, if you like, of our universe that, that, that are moving around in a plasma and, and then you, you're, you're coalescing these regions together. They could have formed right at the, the Planck here, although you know, you've be very, got to be very careful, we don't really understand the physics of quantum gravity, but they could form from then on in and associated with different timescales and as I said the one that's particularly of interest for us today from constraining these would have formed about 10 to the minus 23 seconds after the Big Bang. This is amazing right? We're, 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 we're going to be using observations today to constrain an, a physics event that could have occurred way before the first second. So Professor in this first second we've got the soup of quarks a whole bunch of primordial black holes of various sizes form. What happens next? What's happening to these okay, black holes? Okay, so, so this is where the, the really cool stuff comes in, the thing that makes them really potentially very interesting. And it's thanks to Stephen Hawking. Lots of stuff is thanks to Stephen Hawking. He realised that black holes don't remain black. They evaporate thermal radiation photons, if you like. And as they evaporate, they shrink. Their, their mass decreases. So quantum physics is coming in. They evaporate because of quantum mechanics. Uh, but what he showed was that the, the rate at which a black hole evaporates is inversely proportional to its mass. So a light black hole evaporates very rapidly and the, the associated temperature of this radiation is very high. A massive black hole therefore evaporates very, very slowly and it has an associated very low temperature. So in the early universe, where you have very light black holes, 10 to the minus 5 grams, a gram, 10 to the 17 grams, these things are evaporating quite rapidly. And in fact, anything below 10 to the 15 grams, the ones that are formed after 10 to the minus 23 seconds, they have basically all evaporated by today. The fact that they have evaporated actually places very important constraints on some of the um, models of our universe. The, the ones that are evaporating today uh, are, have a mass of about 10 to the 15 grams. So they're coming to the end of their life now and they're emitting photons of a, orders of 100 giga electron volts. 
and we can look for these, they're looking for gamma rays, we can look for these objects in the sky. We can go and see, are we finding any of them? And the fact we don't see any of these gamma rays places constraints on the number of these black holes that could have been formed at this scale. And that in turn places constraints on the, its contribution to the overall mass of the universe. So it turns out for a, for a black hole of a mass 10 to the 15 grams, Mount Everest type black holes, they have to contribute less than a hundredth of a millionth of the total mass of our universe, energy density of our universe, 10 to the minus 8 of the overall total. And, and you can do the same for all these mass scales by looking at what they produce and constraining them by the fact we're not seeing evidence of them. And in particular in the early universe, right, the ones that have evaporated, the ones that have gone, well, we, you, you say, well, how, how on earth can you test for them? They've got. Well, what they'll have done, of course, is they've produced radiation. As they went, they were very hot, they produced radiation. They will have affected, for example, the time at which the first nuclei wanted to form. It's called nucleosynthesis. It occurred about, after about a second the process began. If you've got lots and lots of very high energy particles that have been emitted by these black holes, they will delay the onset of the formation of these, of these nuclei because every time protons and neutrons try to combine together, these photons will have come in and smacked them apart again. And so it would delay that onset. So but that's their legacy. That's their legacy. But we, we have very good bounds on when this occurred because we can measure the abundance of these, of these nuclei. And that in turn places very con tight constraints on the amount of primordial black holes. That in turn places very tight constraints on the models, the physics models, which led to those primordial black holes forming. And in fact, you can rule out models based on the fact that you would have predicted they would have formed so many of these very small black holes, they would have then injected so much radiation into the universe, that would have delayed the onset of nuclear synthesis. We don't see that, so you work backwards and you're constraining these models. This is how it works. Not detecting them actually sometimes can be quite useful. When the primordial black holes formed, the ones that didn't evaporate, yeah. they sort of stayed embedded in the universe. Like, they're, like, they're, they're, all, they're, they're all evaporating, yeah. just slowly. So the massive ones are evaporating slower than the lighter ones, sorry. But the ones that haven't evaporated yeah. yet, mm. they, they just sort of stay embedded. They're just like, they're just like stuck in random parts of the yeah, universe. Yeah, they're there. They're, they're, and so, for example, those that are, have a mass bigger than 10 to the 15 uh, grams, there's a range of masses for which these, in, in principle, could act as dark matter candidates because they're, they're, they're massive objects, they'd be very massive objects, stuck in, in maybe in the centres of galaxies and there could be lots of them there and, and there are indeed mass ranges. I think, for example, if they've got a mass range, I think it's 10 to the 20 to 10 to the 26 grams, we can't yet rule them out as dark matter candidates. Similarly, if they've got masses in the range of, I think it's 10 solar masses to 100 solar masses, they also can play roles of dark matter candidates. They're different from your typical dark matter candidates, which are sub atomic particles that we associated with supersymmetry, for example, or WIMPs, but they're still plausible candidates and yeah, they're sitting around. And that's one of the goals is to try and search for these objects, but also constrain them by looking for decay products as they evaporate. So for all this talk about what is dark matter and all these tiny little interesting exotic particles they could be, at the end of the day they could just be big hulking, aging, old Black Absolutely, with us all the we time. we can't rule them out yet. Yes, and and you know there's a, there's there are also possibilities that we 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 actually don't really understand the end point of a black hole evaporating. What actually happens is it evaporates. One result is that perhaps they form a relic. They evaporate, evaporate, evaporate down to around the Planck scale, and then they just stop. They stop evaporating anymore. They, and here's my relic. And then you've got all these relics of about the Planck scale circling around the universe. There are reasons people don't like it to do with information and storing of information, but it's not ruled out as a, totally ruled out as a, as a, as a model. Like and, all these, I'm picturing all these big cold shot puts floating in space. Exactly, it's wonderful. And, and then, I mean, they can, you can go a bit further. I mean, you can, because they could form all these different epochs, right, due to these fluctuations, those that correspond to a fluctuation at around a second, the corresponding mass of those black holes would be 10 to the 5 solar masses. So that happens to be the, the type of mass scale that you find in the centres of galaxies, right? These are the supermassive black hole scales, a bit bigger. One possibility is that the progenitors of these supermassive black holes are in fact primordial black holes formed a second after the universe began that then can begin to accumulate matter around them. 
That, as far as I know, hasn't been ruled out. That's still a possibility. We, it should be raining down on us, the radiation from these things. Evaporating. It depends upon the, the number of them out there, right? So, um, and so what this is doing is placing tighter and tighter constraints on the allowed number. And I, I told you what the current bound is. The current bound is their contribution to the overall energy budget has to be less than 10 to the minus 8. It still sounds like it could be reasonable. Radiation is 10 to the minus 4 or so today. Matter, cold out matter, is about 0.3. So these have to be negligible, and the reason they have to be negligible is precisely what you say. It hasn't been seen yet. How long of not saying them? How much more does that noose have to tighten before you say, hang on, maybe these things just aren't there? Oh, that's a really good question. I, I, I think if, for, for you to be able to say that, you would have to somehow rule out the, the mechanism by which they could form you would have to demonstrate that that mechanism isn't physically plausible or has been ruled out for some other reason. If you can't rule out that mechanism, then there's no reason why they shouldn't form. What, what the, the bounds are telling you is that it, that mechanism just obviously wasn't very efficient at forming them in the early universe or, or didn't occur very often. Ultimately, it might be telling us something quite fundamental about our theories. If we don't see any, if we don't see any evidence of primordial black holes, that indeed is going to be telling us something quite important about the very early universe and about the type of physics that went on there that we, that we just haven't yet picked up on. So the physics of nuclear synthesis is really quite well established. The, 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 the process by which the protons and neutrons begin to combine and the rate at which they begin to combine is, is quite well understood. It, it just requires an understanding of nuclear physics and, lo and local um, thermodynamics in, in regions. The, the input of the black holes in this sense is that it changes the, the, the if you like, the, the temperature of the radiation that's around. It determines the time scale at which nuclear synthesis should occur. I agree completely that the physics of how the black holes form and the physics of how many form is based on various assumptions about our understanding of how regions collapse how they break off from the expanding universe and collapse down to form these objects, and then the number of density of these objects that form. That depends upon some input parameter about the distribution of these, of these black holes. That is th that's theoretical input that is either intuitive or ideally would come from some underlying theory, but there's always assumptions made. These are models. We understand our universe as a model. We're always testing the model. And the idea is that we, we test it till it breaks and then we see how what we have to change in the model to make it compatible again with observations. It's important that the, the black holes that are evaporating right now, that are coming to the end of their life, and uh, they are mountain mass black holes. They're formed about 10 to the minus 23 seconds after the Big Bang. Those that formed a second after the Big Bang are already 10 to the 5 solar masses. Those that formed even later after the, you know, are, are correspondingly bigger. And yeah, they're, they're proper black holes. They're, they're, they're evaporating. The ones that are evaporating, you know, that are uh, 10 to the 5 solar mass black holes are evaporating very, very slowly. They've very, got a very low temperature, so they're incredibly difficult to detect. In fact, you know, Hawking would undoubtedly win the Nobel Prize if they could directly detect Hawking radiation. But the problem is, Hawking radiation coming from these massive black holes is 10 to the minus 8 Kelvin or so. It's incredibly lo uh, low. Couldn't they have accreted more mass in yes. that time? Yes, yes, oh wow, well done. <laughs> yes, so one possibility with black holes is that they form and then we know they evaporate, but they also accrete, of course, we know they accrete. And so indeed, it's a, it's a mechanism by which some black holes could actually grow. So we're talking, we're ballpark figures here, right? That's what I'm using. You're, you're quite right. There's classes of black holes that would have formed and then depending on the vicinity, the, the stuff that was around them, they would have started accreting faster than they would be evaporating. But in terms of ballpark figures as to the time scale that a given mass black hole would evaporate on, ones evaporating today correspond to the 10 to 15 gram black holes. If you created many, many more grams of matter, they'll evaporate correspondingly later on. The probability of them forming now is extremely rare. Because we don't have those soups. No, those that's right. Soups that's right. It would take a, a ginormous fluctuation to, to, to cause it. Whereas, and, and the density basically has dropped so much. I think that's the key thing that, 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 as you say, we don't have that soup. The density of this soup is so, so low now 
that you would just, you know, you'd have to have a massive bucket of putting it all back together. Whereas in the early universe, the density is much, much higher, and it's so easier to do that. A flick then to make one. Oh yeah, they were just popping up everywhere. Yeah, yeah. There is a possible candidate for a sighting of primordial black holes. You mentioned. So, uh, of course, this is an early, early work, but the amazing discovery by the LIGO team of of the coalescing black holes. These black holes uh, have masses of around thirty solar masses, and it's actually quite difficult to figure out a mechanism by which you form 30 solar mass black holes, never mind um, then having them in pairs. You know, how come they're formed in pairs that are, are circling one another? So it has led to a few papers suggesting, actually, maybe these are the seeds of these are, are primordial black holes, which would have formed suitably early in the universe. You can then get 30 solar mass black holes. But once again, what's interesting, you know, the way science works, the, 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 once this discovery was announced, and it surprised everybody, Within a few weeks, the first sets of papers came out claiming this, but even, but you know, Anne, Anne Green here, my colleague here at Nottingham, was able to show that actually it's going to be very difficult to have this result explained in terms of these primordial black holes because of constraints that emerge from looking at the decay products of black holes and that constrains the density that you're going to get of them. It doesn't mean they're not there and it doesn't yet mean it, it's not this mechanism and it's a very intriguing mechanism I think but that's the way science works you come out with an idea then you test the idea against observations. A black hole that could range from millions to trillions times the mass of our Sun and so it's important to consider this black hole even though physically compared to the size of the galaxy it's very very small 